Okay. Niron, I think we shall start, right? Yes. Okay. So everyone, hello. So nice to see you. Um, this is our final session in the course Managing Business in Time of uh, Crisis. And thank you all for joining us. We also wish to thank our friends of IDC who joined the Zoom and also mentioned that this session is broadcasted live on Facebook for uh, our alumni. So hello alumni on Facebook. And what is planned for today? So today we have two very distinguished guests from the Wharton School, Professor Marwa Gillen and Professor Jerry Wind. And we are very honored that you agreed to join us. Thank you so much. Uh, the schedule for today is to begin with Professor Gillen, who will talk about economic and business impact of COVID-19. We will then have a short break. And in the second part of the session, Professor Wind will talk about opportunities in times of crisis. At the end of today's session, we will also have a really quick wrap up for the course. So let's begin. And uh, Niron, I'm passing the mic to you. OK, thank you, uh, Yanat. So uh, I'm really thr thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Professor Mauro Gillen from uh, the Water School. So Mauro is not only the Zandman professor in, in international management and coming from international business, uh, he's one of uh, my heroes in the field but he's also one of the most original thinkers in the Wharton School and his papers have been published in top academic journals and also uh, op-eds in all the leading uh, uh, magazines that you can think of. Importantly for this session, uh, Mauro has been an inspiration for us that uh, uh, he has uh, initiated a course uh, at Wharton that is talking about business uh, under uh, conditions of crisis and this is actually I think what uh, caught the eye of Yonat and then she approached me and we decided uh, to pull this uh, course and uh, I'm really happy that we have uh, the man himself with us. So Mauro, please go ahead. Thank you so much Aniron. Please at any moment let me know if my audio or my video is not working properly. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I think I may have uh, seen you uh, in the past uh, in other, uh, on other occasions, uh, but it's always a pleasure to share with you, uh, students from IDC, some, some time together. And today we have um, about 40 minutes now. I'm going to stop at some point halfway through to take uh, your questions. Uh, so please uh, use the chat feature, I believe it's the chat feature that we're going to be using uh, for questions, uh, Q&A. Um, and uh, I'd like to tell you, as Nilo was saying, about the uh, impact that this pandemic is having on businesses. Uh, so I'd like to essentially uh, think uh, here with you about what may be coming next in terms of business transformation. I'm going to start sharing my PowerPoints and uh, remember that um, I believe the PowerPoints will be made uh, available to you or they have already been made available. And in that case, you don't need to do uh, screenshots. Uh, so you don't let me know if uh, this is not full screen. Um, so the presentation has two parts, uh, and uh, these two parts essentially correspond to first uh, more of a macro picture as to what I see coming in terms of the effects of this pandemic. And then secondly, uh, the impact on four areas of uh, businesses, okay? Uh, so first about the macro picture, I'd like to persuade you that I think uh, there are two indicators that are the best for thinking about what the impact of this pandemic will be in the near future, and also how quickly we're going to be recovering from the economic shock. Um, so uh, I am going to be showing you indicators for these two sets of numbers for a number of countries around the world. Unfortunately, I don't have the numbers for Israel, uh, but uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, maybe you know what the numbers look like now. So the first one has to do with consumers. We are in a consumer economy at the end of the day. And uh, what I, I want to show you is a number of charts that compare pairs of countries. So here we have the US and China. And this is the classic consumer confidence index, okay? Uh, and as you can see, uh, for these two countries, over the last few weeks, the indicator dropped very, very quickly. There was a dramatic decline in consumer confidence. But the good news is that over the last two weeks or so, there has been a rebound in consumer confidence. And of course, consumer confidence is forward looking. Consumer confidence it tells us something about what people are planning to do 
over the next uh, uh, few weeks and months. And essentially what this indicator tells us for the US and China is that uh, consumers are getting more confident about uh, what's going on in the economy. But for me, the single most important thing about this chart, however, is not so much the rebound, but rather that the um, change in this indicator, the decline, the decrease in this indicator has not been as deep as the one that we saw 12 years ago during the global financial crisis. If you take a look at the chart carefully, and I think that's really important. People are speculating, why is that the case? I mean, this crisis uh, you know, certainly has much higher unemployment, seems to be more difficult to deal with, but yet consumer confidence hasn't collapsed as much as it did 12 years ago. And I think um, you know, those who claim that governments and central banks have intervened more quickly, I think uh, they are correct. But I think that there's another factor here, which was not present 12 years ago, which is technology. Uh, and consumers have been using both as employees and as consumers, people have been using technology very intensively over the last few weeks. Let me now go to Europe and Japan, European Union and Japan. Uh, and again, you see a decline in this case, actually as deep as what happened uh, 12 years ago. Uh, but again, good news in the sense that you can see at the, uh, towards the right of the chart, in the last uh, couple of weeks, there has been a rebound as well in consumer confidence in the European Union and in Japan, which are the next uh, two uh, largest markets in the world. Uh, this is for uh, Germany and France, the largest economies in the Eurozone, and we do see also some signs of a, of a revival. Uh, and then the second indicator that I want to share with you is the one that you see on the screen right now. So on the one hand, we have consumer confidence, but now how about companies and especially manufacturing companies? Are they becoming more or less confident in the future? So the indicator here is called the manufacturing PMI. PMI stands for Purchasing Managers Index. So again, it's a, an index of uh, confidence on the part of purchasing managers or companies. And you can imagine that if purchasing managers become more optimistic, that is a good omen for the economy. That's a good prospect for the economy. Uh, once again, here we have uh, first the two largest economies in the world, the US and China. And as you can see, very, very large decline uh, in both countries, but followed over the last few weeks by a recovery. So once again, this is obviously good news. European Union and Japan, we still don't see the recovery in Japan, but we do see in, uh, in the European Union that recovery in the last uh, couple of weeks in this indicator of manufacturing PMI. And then lastly, Germany and France, the two largest economies in Europe, again, very, very strong rebounds in both cases. Okay, so that's a good news. I am actually quite encouraged by this in the sense that you know, if consumer confidence and if the confidence of purchasing managers at manufacturing firms are turning, if they are rebounding, that is good news for the economy. So that's the first, uh, you know, part uh, that I wanted to uh, talk to you about, the macro picture, how I see it, right? And again, personally, I put a lot of faith in these two indicators, uh, consumer confidence and manufacturing PMI. But let me now, in the last 10 minutes or 12 minutes before uh, I start answering your questions, let me tell you about uh, the business impact. And I'd like to you know, focus your attention on four areas that I strongly believe are going to be the four areas that are gonna change the most as a result of uh, the pandemic and the economic crisis triggered by this pandemic. So the four areas are supply chain, automation, remote work, and e-commerce, okay? So they cover pretty much the entire value chain of the firm from securing inputs all the way down to the final buyer uh, or consumer, okay? So let me begin by showing you the results of a survey conducted by PwC here in the United States. And as you can see, we have two readings for this survey. It is April 22nd and May 6th. The results are fairly consistent between the two dates. 
And it's a survey of CFOs, chief financial officers. I personally prefer to listen to CFOs than to CEOs or operations managers uh, or the chief marketing officers because the CFOs worry about the bottom line, right? And uh, they're very powerful, as you know. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we should pay a lot of attention to what is it that they think may change as a result of this crisis. And as you can see, the first three bars that you see on the left, uh, change workplace safety measures, reconfigure work sites to promote physical distancing, and change shifts and alternate crews to reduce exposure, those are to be expected, right? Every company, every organization, every university will need to do that, right? And uh, accordingly, the percentages of CFOs who are saying that they think their companies are gonna do that are very, very high, right? Definitely above uh, 50%. But I want to specifically bring to your attention a more important uh, uh, question, which is the one at the bottom on the, on the left make remote work a permanent option for roles that allow it. And here you see that nearly 50% of the CFOs are thinking that that's something that maybe their company should be doing. And then the next one, accelerate automation and new ways of working. And that's around 40%, right? 38, 39, 40% of all of the CFOs. So as you can see, even managers who are not directly involved in making their companies more automated, or you know, they're not the human resource managers, right? Uh, in terms of the remote work option, they're thinking that maybe as a result of this crisis, those are two things that companies ought to be doing. So let me dig a little bit deeper now on the supply chain issue, okay? Uh, that was the first topic that I uh, was sharing with you. So this is another survey conducted about a month ago. And this is a survey of managers handling supply chains here in the United States. And it's very clear what they experienced. Volume declines, transit delays, delays from port to customer, lack of capacity. Remember the demand for certain essential goods went through the roof. So it's not surprising that some of them experienced lack of capacity to deal with that uh, you know, big spike in demand. Okay, so that's... Uh, those are the symptoms, right, of uh, what has been going on. Now, when you ask these managers in charge of supply chains, will you change your shipping and supply chain strategies because of your experience with the coronavirus pandemic? 42% say yes, and an additional 28, 29% say maybe. So you have two thirds of them who are essentially telling us, we're gonna be rethinking our supply chain, right, uh, after this pandemic. And then if you ask them, this is, I think, the more interesting part. What do you think is needed in the future? They will tell you, well, in order to restructure our supply chain, we will need to invest in assets. We will need to invest in employees. Maybe we will need to make acquisitions. But the single most frequent answer, two thirds of them, 67.3%, is investments in technology, okay? So, what is it that I think, oh, by the way, if you ask CFOs about the supply chain, this is another set of data here, you get the exact same answer. That is to say that they're thinking there's gonna be quite a few changes in terms of how the supply chain is um, uh, going to be um, evolving in the future. And uh, it's very clear that CFOs, chief financial officers, are very much thinking about supply chain issues in the wake of this pandemic. So how is the supply chain gonna change? Well, I think uh, you know, something is gonna change uh, which is of fundamental importance. Over the last few decades, companies have been building supply chains on the basis of the principle of just in time. That has been the golden you know, stand, the gold standard okay, for supply chains. Just in time, just in time, just in time. Efficiencies everywhere. I personally believe that companies are gonna be moving away from that towards more of a just-in-case, and that's my own phrase, just-in-case supply chains, okay? In other words, to make those supply chains more resilient, more um, resistant to disruptions, to big shocks, such as, for example, a pandemic. And you see, the trend already started in 2011. That's nine years ago. 
If you remember that year, there was a big earthquake and tsunami in Japan, which brought about the nuclear accident at the plant. But in addition to that, it disrupted business in Japan and especially transportation. And given that Japan produces so many components and parts that companies around the world use, within a few weeks, supply chains in North America, in Europe, and in other parts of Asia felt the effects of the Japanese tsunami. So since then, companies have been rethinking their supply chains. The second warning that we've had about this was the trade war between the US and China. The trade war between the US and China before this pandemic in the years 2011, I'm sorry, 2018 and 2019, already prompted companies around the world, but especially here in the United States, to make changes to the supply chains, to make them more resilient, right? So you might be wondering, is this going to increase costs? Is this going to reduce efficiency? And the answer is, of course. If you move away from just in time to just in case, efficiency is going to suffer. But once again, the benefit will be that the supply chain is going to become more resilient. So at the end of the day, we're gonna to have to strike a different balance between efficiency and resilience in supply chains. Um, well, yes? There is a question of uh, Oz. Oz, do you want to ask your question about the supply yes. chain? Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, do you mean, when you say go more ahead. resilient, do you mean more uh, domestic uh, dependent? Like homegrown yeah. and stuff? Yes. So are you asking whether there's going to be onshoring, right? as opposed yeah. to offshoring. Yes, yeah, so, so that's a great question. Look, um, I am going to give you an answer that is based on what we already know. So it's not speculation on my part, okay? I think there's going to, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment uh, the evidence. I think there's gonna be very little onshoring, very little. In other words, very few American firms are gonna bring their supply chains back to the US. Very few French firms are gonna bring the supply chain back to France. Okay, why do I say this? Well, we have evidence from the US-China trade war. The US-China trade war during 2019 prompted many American firms to change their supply chains. So did they bring the supply chain from China all the way back to the United States? The answer is no. What they did was instead of sourcing from China, they started to source from Taiwan, Vietnam, Mexico, and Eastern Europe. Those were the big winners, okay? And the reason, of course, is that it is uh, very expensive to produce certain things in the United States or to produce them in Europe, right? Or in Japan, for that matter. So having said that, I think supply chains will become shorter. In other words, many American firms will prefer Mexico over China because it's uh, closer by. And in some cases, I'm gonna tell you about one such case in a moment, in a, in a couple of minutes, um, there will be more local sourcing, okay? So within uh, the United States or within Europe. But I think uh, those are going to be very rare exceptions. Now, having said that, governments could also regulate for essential goods, for example, healthcare equipment. They could say, you need to have all of the critical components for ventilators, for example, manufactured in the US or manufactured in Europe, right? Depending on the country. Well, that of course would force more onshoring but I think governments will be very careful not to overregulate uh, this matter, okay? But it could happen in certain industries. So that's the supply chain. Let me move on to the other three topics uh, and then uh, open up to more general Q&A. But by all means, Niron, if there's another question, let me know, okay? There are a few, but I, maybe we will, you know- in, Yes, in, let, me, in, let me put all of the, because I, I may be answering some of them. Uh, yeah. So I only need about uh, seven more minutes and then we have, uh, you know, more than 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so the second big uh, uh, topic I think is automation. You saw earlier the CFOs, a third of them telling us that they expect more automation. Why is that the case? Well, because the pandemic has created new incentives for automation. Uh, companies operations have been disrupted. They have um, sent their workers home, but you see the robots, you don't need to send them home. They can continue working. So building resiliency in business operations creates incentives for automation. 
I think uh, this is going to happen in the manufacturing sector, but I think it's going to be even more pronounced in the service sector, right? And especially among white collar, non-manual occupations, okay? Uh, so this is something that we're anticipating. Uh, you saw the survey from the CFOs earlier. Now, uh, of course, uh, this is going to create social problems. If automation was already problematic before the pandemic, if we had technological unemployment, I think we have to be very careful and we have to help those people who may be uh, affected by this renewed wave of automation in the wake of this pandemic. Let me give you an example. Warehouse automation. As you know, this has been a problem during this pandemic. Not enough workers and also many of them getting sick because of exposure to the virus, okay? At Amazon and many other types of companies. What you see over here is the blue lines and bars are the forecasts for investments in warehouse automation before the pandemic. Those were the forecasts before the pandemic. And then the gray bars are the forecasts after the pandemic has taken place. Okay, so for the year 2020, the forecast, the new forecast is lower. Well, that's because the economy is in recession. Okay, don't be fooled by that. But then look at 21, 22, 23. The new forecast is that there will be more investment in warehouse automation, right? The revised forecast is more investment, not less, in warehouse automation. Now, the third topic that I told you about, remote work. So I want to bring to your attention two numbers, okay? This is for the US, and we can discuss, uh, if you give me the numbers, Israel later, okay? So um, for the United States, before this crisis, 37% of jobs could be remote, could be performed remote. Not all jobs can be performed remotely, okay? And then also before the pandemic, only 3% of the jobs were performed, were actually performed remotely most of the time. In some European countries, by the way, mostly Scandinavia, this second number is 18 to 23%. They have more experience working remotely at least part of the week, okay? Now, what has happened after the pandemic? Well, the 3%, of course, is now 30% or 35%, right? A lot of people are working from home, okay? The big question is, is that number going to go back down to 3%? I don't think so. Most companies, as you know, have had so far good experiences. Most uh, employees working from home are reasonably happy with it. Uh, I think uh, we're going to go towards a hybrid model in the sense that people will work more days from home, but not completely or exclusively from home. But for me, the more interesting question is, what's going to happen to the 37%, okay? The 37% so far hasn't changed, okay? It's the upper limit. It's how many jobs could potentially be performed from home. Well, I think that number is going to go up. You heard the CFOs earlier. The CFOs are telling us we're ready to make investments to restructure our operations so that more jobs can be performed from the home. They think that will help them cut costs and maybe keep employees happier. So that 37%, my forecast, is that it will slowly increase to 40% to 45% over the next few years as companies restructure their operations. Now, one last point about remote work. Where are people working from? Well, 84% before the pandemic, 84% were working from home. 8% from co-working spaces and 4% from coffee shops or cafes. I think uh, post-COVID, most uh, forecasts that I've seen is that um, co-working spaces are going to be difficult uh, places, right? Uh, there's going to be perhaps less emphasis on them. Unless, of course, Employees say, you know, I don't want to go to the office because it's a one hour commute for me, but I don't want to stay at home either. Why don't you create a satellite office? Why don't you uh, rent some space uh, in a co-working uh, building? Okay, uh, so we shall see what happens with that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we don't have still very good data. And then the last thing that I want to bring to your attention, point number four is e-commerce. 
And as you know, the biggest explosion that we've seen in terms of technology use by workers, by consumers, has been in the form of digital platforms. Um, so work and education platforms, such as the one that we're using right now, uh, use has gone through the roof. Computer games, online shopping, of course, streaming, you name it, okay? So now, I want to bring to your attention something very important. Uh, because, yes, e-commerce is going through the roof. Yes, this crisis accelerates, intensifies the trend towards e-commerce. But I want to present to you here a comparison. Amazon is the big player in e-commerce in the United States and in uh, several other countries around the world. And you can see that the stock price for Amazon has done much better over the last few weeks than the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is the index that you see at the bottom in purple, okay? But Shopify, which is a marketplace, is an e-commerce platform, Canadian, has done even better than Amazon. So what is it that Shopify has done? Well, Shopify is just a marketplace, okay? Amazon is several other things in addition to a marketplace. So Shopify allows other companies to establish a storefront on their platforms so that they can reach consumers. But Shopify identified a void in the market, like a huge opportunity. And that opportunity was e-commerce taking place at distances of less than 15 miles, which is something that Amazon has never really bothered to address specifically. So these are mostly companies, shops, businesses, relatively small, which have been completely disrupted by the pandemic. In many cases, they've been forced to shut down. So they have created a storefront on Shopify. And not only that, Shopify also sells them all of the necessary services so that they can operate as online storefronts. So they help them with their payments. They help them with collecting payments from uh, consumers. They're helping them managing cash flows. They're helping them with their online marketing, which they hadn't done in any organized way before. Uh, and of course, they're helping them with the fulfillment of orders, once again, at distances of less than 15 miles. Uh, this is how Shopify has been able to grow so quickly, and it gets reflected, as you can see over here, in the stock price. So last uh, thing, and I'm going to leave this on the screen. Um, in columns, you see the four areas that I've noted, I think are going to be the biggest changes, supply chains, automation, remote work, and e-commerce. And on the left, you see technologies that may be used to um, reinvent, to transform companies in terms of their supply chains, automation, remote work, and e-commerce. I think that this crisis is only going to accelerate the use of technology, and we've only seen the beginning. So let me stop there, Niran. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I'm going to put my headsets on to listen to them carefully. All right. And, yeah. uh, we have about the uh, we have about 16 minutes left, right? Yeah, no problem. Uh, let's start with Ariel. I think he had a question about the CFO survey, Ariel. Are you still with us? Yeah, I was just curious about the, the uh, before the COVID, how it how have it changed? Uh, but yes, uh, uh, the numbers so are before the COVID and after, uh, because this is just yeah. while the pandemic. Yes. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for your question. So notice that the, the question that was asked is, which of the following is your company planning to implement once you start the transition back to on-site work? The first three that you see, change work to a safe trick of your work sites and change shifts or other crews are specific to the pandemic, right? So those are new things about social and physical distancing and so on and so forth. So those questions weren't asked uh, earlier. Now, remote work. Um, there was, uh, remember, only 3% of American workers were doing remote work on a regular basis before this pandemic. So that question, make remote work on a, per a permanent option for roles that allow it, that's entirely new. Very few companies in the United States uh, before this pandemic allowed employees to work remotely from home on a permanent basis. 
unless, of course, they really wanted that person and that person couldn't be next to the office and commute to the office, okay? Now, automation, that question, uh, so if I remember correctly, the uh, 37, 40% that you see for automation, that uh, on the part of the CFOs represents a big jump. Uh, so no more than 10% were saying before this crisis, we want to accelerate uh, automation, right? Companies, of course, as you know, had automation plans in place before the pandemic. But the point here yeah. is that it has become so much uh, of a trend since then. Thank you. Uh, Team Amphi, I see that you had a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, uh, Kobe. Uh, sorry, still can't change the name. Yeah, yeah. What, what can you do? Um, so I had a question about the efficiencies or the, ju the just in case um, mm -hmm. situation that you presented. Like, f for example, COVID 19, it's a black swan event. It's really out of the blue. Um, and for example, if you have an e commerce store for, like that, you're getting a thousand orders a week. Um, and it's pretty stable throughout the year and on Christmas it triples. Like, to me, it sounds like the redundancies that you would call, would like cause to be ready in case at 10 X's at any stage in like once every five, 10, 15 years would like, it wouldn't be worth it. Rather, let's keep it efficient. When something crazy happens, everything breaks and overall it makes, it makes sense. Yeah, so um, that's a great uh, question. And of course, the answer hinges on how frequent and how likely these disruptive events are, right? I mean, that's the, the whole point. So let me go back to what I mentioned earlier, the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, 2011. As a result of that, companies in the automobile industry changed their supply chains. Mm -hmm. They made them more... Uh, I mean, less reliant on just-in-time. They increased inventories and buffers. And they also diversified their sources of supply. Instead of, instead of having just one supplier for a certain component, they moved to have multiple suppliers. Okay, so that has already been going on because, again, you know, this is not the first time that supply chains have been disrupted. Now, in 2011, it was pretty much the automobile industry that was affected because, again, the, the Japanese... Uh, part suppliers play a very, very big role in the global automobile industry. Uh, but then came the trade war, right? I mean, this pandemic comes not just, um, you know, uh, as an out of the sky, of the blue sky event, as you said, but it comes a few months after, especially American companies have been going through a very difficult situation in which they saw that the kinds of parts and components or finished products that they were bringing to the United States from China increased in price because of tariffs, right? Tariffs that were going up with no end in sight. And so they decided, as I told you earlier, to shift their sourcing to Taiwan, to Vietnam, to Mexico. But not only that, instead of just sourcing from one of those countries, they decided, let's source from several, right? Let's not put all the eggs in one basket. That's the saying that we have here in the United States. I'm sure you probably use a similar one over there, right? So let's not put all the eggs in one basket. So the, the, the thing is, um, this is not the first disruptive event, right? Uh, yes, it is the first big pandemic since, I guess, the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. Uh, the AIDS pandemic, you know, was very different in nature. Uh, although it also uh, produced uh, millions of deaths, as you know. Uh, so I think, uh, I think companies have realized that for one reason or another, it doesn't have to be a pandemic. It can be a trade war or it can be an earthquake. Their supply chains were, over the last 10 years, been disrupted too frequently. And they have already taken action, right? But I agree with you that you cannot go from one extreme to the other, right? So... All, what I'm arguing is a different balance, right? That's what's going on. It's not that they're going from just in time, right? What that extreme all the way to, oh my God, I mean, we're only going to do, you know, uh, this with big inventories and so on and so forth. Um, so like my follow-up on that would be, a spe well, firstly, I think sometimes uh, there's overreactions, like, oh my gosh, my supply chain got hit very hard. I have to, 
um, do it everywhere. And then over years, then we, we start going back into the efficiencies. I mm -hmm. think um, maybe that's what we'd see. But I think especially for e-commerce, which is notoriously um, competitive, where mm -hmm. people are going online and buying for the cheapest, I don't really see room for making resilient businesses where if there's still the ability for one person to go to one supplier, one um, distributor, and they can undercut your prices by 10%, I don't, I don't really see how that would work. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think uh, the argument uh, works better um, and we should expect more change as a result. When we're talking about complex assembled goods, where if you don't have one critical component, then you're out of business. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so that's why I think, uh, you know, the automobile industry has been among the first to actually move in that direction. Uh, but also consider branded goods, right? Even personal, you know, uh, like, for example, skincare, like a cream, right? You have a brand on it. And uh, maybe before this pandemic, you only have one factory in the world that produced that. Um, well, I think those companies are also going to be rethinking their uh, supply chain in the sense that maybe they want to diversify a little bit, right? Because uh, that company, if uh, they do not have enough product on hand, let's say for the holiday season, right, which here in the United States is in December, as you know, uh, then they're going to be in big trouble because then their customers are going to go to the competition. So at the end of the day, I think, so I'm not saying that this is um, market unfriendly. I think that the very dynamic of competition will invite companies to rethink, at least in part, how much they depend on one single source of supply. That's the way I would put it, right? Because they don't want to lose in the marketplace to the competitors if they are affected by a disruption in their supply chain. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marianne Steinberg, is your question on supply chain is still relevant? All right, so uh, Joram, you had the question? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, because a lot of the work you presented us relies on forward-looking indicators, I was wondering if there's a difference between changes that CEOs or CFOs wanted to make anyway, and now they believe will get accelerated, and changes they did not want to make, and now they think, well, maybe we should. So do you think yes. there will be a difference between, between such and their actual future development? Yes, yes. So that's a great uh, question. Uh, it's a, uh, I guess it's a, a, you're making the, the previous question even more general, right? Uh, so look, um, absolutely right. So I would say of the four things that you see over here, automation uh, and uh, e-commerce are two trends that are, it's just we're talking about acceleration here, right? So automation was already going on. E-commerce was already going on, right? Uh, growing. I think this crisis, of course, has led already in e-commerce to a huge acceleration, intensification of that trend, and also automation. I think supply chains and remote work are different, though. So supply chains, if uh, we look outside of the automobile industry, I think this is uh, more of uh, something that the crisis has created, except, as I said, for those companies that were affected by the US-China trade war, okay? Uh, but I think the clearest example of something that is really a new thing that companies were doing, but not really thinking that much about it, is remote work. I mean, look, at least here in the United States, over the last few years, companies, uh, even companies like Google or Facebook, that can have all of their employees work from home. They were renting, you know, tens of thousands of square meters of office space in New York, in San Francisco, in very expensive places, right? Um, so they were not thinking about remote work up until two months ago or three months ago. Proof of that is that they were renting office space. Uh, the, the, the office, um, office space market in New York City was booming before this, uh, this epidemic. So I think remote work is the clearest example of an area that companies, CFOs in particular, were not really you know, focused on before this pandemic. Now, the shutdowns, of course, the lockdowns, the stay at home uh, orders have you know, essentially forced companies to consider remote work. And now they're starting to see the potential opportunities in remote work. 
And also employees like you and I are also thinking, well, I wouldn't uh, mind being able to work from home a couple of days a week, right? So um, let me just do the ranking again. I think e-commerce was basically something that was going on before this accelerates. Next comes automation, then supply chains, and then remote work. And I would, you know, in answer to your question, say remote work was the clearest area in which companies were not really, you know, that interested before the pandemic. But now everybody seems to be very interested in remote work practices. Thank you. Uh, Juliana? Hello, everyone. Hello, Mauro. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Um, companies are restructuring their operations and the processes might benefit from it, from the automation and all the priorities you mentioned. Uh, I'm pretty concerned about the corporation's culture. What is going to hold the corporation culture if people is starting to work from home? What <laughs> might hold them together? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. And uh, you see, let me answer the question based on what we know, okay, as opposed to once again, speculating. Uh, you see, multinational firms, companies with operations in many different countries, um, over the last uh, 30 years or so, have been using a technique called virtual teams, right? So for a particular project, uh, instead of having uh, managers or people from just one location working on the project, they realized a long time ago that maybe they have the talent or the expertise necessary for that project in different parts of the world. So they have been uh, working with these virtual teams for a long time, right? And what we've learned from those virtual teams is that they do not work unless you create a common culture within that team, right? So I am corroborating what you said, which is that the danger with remote work, because virtual teams are a form of remote work, right? In the sense that people are in different locations. Maybe they're working from the office, right? But they are collaborating with people in other locations. So it falls under the remote work kind of thing because you're having people you know, participate in teams um, from different locations. And uh, all of the research in that area indicates that unless you create a shared culture among the virtual team members, it's not gonna work. There's a Wharton professor, Martine Haas, who has done a lot of research on this. So if you go to her website, um, she has a very nice article that actually explains what we've learned from virtual teams, right? And I think those lessons are completely applicable, right? So that's the danger. And just to finish my answer to your question, that's why I believe that the two extremes are impossible. So one extreme after this pandemic is everybody goes back to the office, okay? Because some people don't want to go back to the office. And of course the CFOs see that they can save money if people don't go to the office, right? Because they don't have to rent as much office space. The other extreme, which is everybody works from home, in the long run, I think that is impossible also because then the corporate culture would suffer, okay? I completely agree with you. And that's why I was arguing a few moments ago that we're gonna have a happy medium. We're gonna have a hybrid with people working some days from home, but not always from home, right? I think that's what's gonna happen. Let's take one last question from Kovi that uh, you will find familiar, but with a different name, Kovi. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering where you saw, especially being a part of university, where you see online learning and ed tech. Do you think that's going to be like remote yes. work? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, right now it's a necessity, as you know. Look, I'm a big, big, big champion of uh, online learning. And let me just do some publicity here. Over the last few years, I've launched at Wharton several online classes. And uh, so three of them. And the, uh, the last one that you see over there, I'm actually taping it this week. Uh, Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, which is where Wharton is, uh, has launched an entire BA program online, right? The bachelor's degree, uh, our basic degree for undergraduates, right? Which is a very big step for an Ivy League institution to do this. So I'm a big champion of this. I think there's a mistake when people think about online education as a substitute for classroom instruction. 
I think the future is hybrid again. I think the future is one that combines online and in classroom. And I think that's exactly what this crisis is calling for. Universities, I'm sure this is also IDC, as I, I was uh, listening to earlier, uh, are moving towards a hybrid model, right? At least for the time being, we're gonna have some classroom instruction, we're gonna have online segments. And I think that blended model is gonna stick. I think that blended model in the end, uh, we're gonna find it very effective because you see, what's the point of having 400 students taking introduction to calculus in the classroom? It's better to do that online and then have you know, problem solving sessions in smaller groups, right? Um, so I think that's what's going on. And um, uh, so I, 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 I'm a big champion of this. I think uh, online education is going to continue, but it's not going to replace classroom. It's going to be synergistic with classroom education. What do you see as the main pros of classrooms? Well, uh, first of all, going back to Juliana's uh, question, culture. You're not only uh, conveying knowledge, you're creating you know, a cohort of people, a class. You know each other, right? Uh, you've been socializing. I think that's also a very important part. You learn from others. I think there's nothing like classroom interaction. But not only that, I mean, think also about uh, all universities, including your school, they organize trips, right? I mean, you take people to other locations. Well, uh, you cannot do that online. I mean, you need to actually, you know, get people moving, right? But you can prepare them online prior to their trip, right? So I think slowly but surely, uh, once we have treatments for this uh, virus and we have uh, hopefully a vaccine in a couple of years or so, uh, we will go back to where we were in terms of education. But I think that would be a mistake if we go all the way back to where we were. I think we should continue using online but in a more blended way, okay? And by the way, Nirong, if you allow me, uh, before you, uh, we make the transition towards uh, Jerry, Wynn, um, here on the PowerPoints, you also have these resources that I've put together. Uh, they're all completely free, so you, know, you can go there. We have videos. Um, we have all sorts of things that you can find over there on the uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 on business. Thank you very much, Mauro, for a very intriguing and insightful lecture. Really, it has been a pleasure uh, to hear all these insights and uh, really thought-provoking. And thank you very much for uh, waking up so early for us. Yes. yes. And Thanks. for inspiring us to do this course. Uh, thank I, you very much. I share thank you. Ones, uh, thank you. you. It's really an inspiration. And thank you so much for willing to join our, our, this course and wake up so early for us. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. So we'll take a 12-minute break and meet you back at the 3.30 sharp, which is uh, 8.30 uh, Professor Gillen and wins uh, 8.30 a.m. For us, it will be 3.30. So see you in 12 minutes.